When it comes down to it, though, in my opinion, I think in a lot of others, there are two Israeli crime families that really rise above the rest, and that's the Abergils, who I've mentioned a bunch, and the Rosenstein family. And I could do an entire episode just on the Abergils because Yitzhak, the leader, like I said, criminal prodigy, the likes of which I've rarely seen. He's the son of Moroccan immigrant parents, and he grows up the youngest of 10 siblings in the rough city of Lod, in the projects in the 70s. And this is a lot from, from Ben's own reporting. His father was an alcoholic, and his mother worked a bunch of jobs that was never home. He had older brothers that were in and out of prison and addicted to drugs. This is a quote he told the court, I can remember that we were always lacking. If Abergil is to be believed, his gangsterdom started at literally three years old, because honestly, who remembers being three, when he started shoplifting and stealing food. He was allegedly hiding guns, drugs, and like grenades for dealers and gangsters when he was five or six years old. He said he would use shapes and stuff to identify whose guns was whose when he hid them. That was his system. At 12, he graduated to running a stash house selling hash and heroin with his brother. And at 14, he was smuggling drugs in the jail for one of his other brothers. 14 is also when he shot someone for the first time, a 33-year-old who wouldn't let him into like a rec center or something like that, some sort of teen party because he was wearing shorts. And look, I'm not condoning violence or saying bouncers sometimes deserve to get shot, but also sometimes bouncers deserve to get shot. Yeah, I think that you can make a, a case for that in some instances. I think it's, with this particular <laughs> case, it's... It's to know this is very much an Israeli kind of underworld cliche. Somebody stabbing some guy at a club who didn't let him in. Bouncers get stabbed like that. I mean, it's happened fairly, you know, a, a good number of times. There's also a kind of, there may be arguably a racial component in that as well. Because, you know, when you come up to the club, they're going to look at how you look and how you dress and your skin. And they're going to look also, if they ask you for your ID, on that ID, they can see your last name and where you're from. And so by the name of that town and your last name, a lot of these bouncers are going to make a decision whether or not to let you in. But that's, that's, I'm not saying that's not what happened here. I'm just saying when these things do happen. It, it happens. Right. Uh, by 16, he's running multiple trap houses and importing drugs in from the Netherlands. I mean, this is like LeBron James level type of talent right here. This kid is a prodigy. He's also illiterate, but we'll get to that later. He soon becomes a, a borer. Borer? How do you say it? Borer. Uh, borer. Yeah. It comes from the word to... Which, uh, to clear stuff up or to clarify, to make obvious. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like the Israeli version of, of a Russian thief-in-law, the kind of high-level respected criminal who oversees other criminal disputes. And then he kills somebody, a pimp that allegedly threatened him with a grenade. He's, I think, 17 at this time, by the way, 17 and he kills this guy. So during the trial, his oldest childhood friend, who was also engaged to his sister, betrays him and testifies against him. And according to Abergil, he never gets over that. He gets sentenced to 30 years, but ends up doing 12. But and Ben, my question is like, like 12 on 30. How does that, how does that happen? Right. So one, one thing in general about, about Israel, there, there tends to be um, not, not very serious sentences for, for crimes, um, especially compared to the states. You don't have the sort of thing where a guy gets busted for, for trafficking and he gets a life sentence or a guy does armed robbery with the, you know, and he gets 30 years, no chance of parole. You don't, you don't have that. And a life sentence is 30 years. Um, and he, I think him getting out early was, was largely because he was 17. It was also because he, he, when, when he was in jail, he was, he was famous already. He was famous on the street before he went into jail. He was famous in prison and he became kind of like a guy out of a movie who just sort of like ran the prison and had real criminals just kind of waiting on him as a young man, you know, still a teenager. And he was just a master manipulator. So he had, and it's one of the more bizarre stories. He he, he built up a friendship with the warden and he convinced the warden that, you know, he was, he was changing his ways, a kind of classic story. And he actually convinced the warden to take him to be on a TV show. Cause that's the other thing, not just bad, not just low sentences, Israeli criminals get a lot of furloughs, which I in general tend to be kind of in favor of, but either way he on a furlough, they were, they were, they were, took him to be on this primetime TV talk show. And you can find it on YouTube. It's him being interviewed about how he, has changed his ways and now he's a student of philosophy he even read a poem that he made and then uh, not long after that he gets released and becomes you know the most feared criminal in the country so i think it's a it's a case of a guy being 17 when he did the crime doing 12 years which is pretty pretty good for israel and then uh just being able to manipulate his way out there in prison he stirs up like a ben said a whole ton of shit stabs people and he becomes his boss and he also meets a guy called shmaya angel 
Angel? Angel? How would yeah. you uh, say his last name? Angel. 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 Uh, yeah. Oh, he's a much older first generation Israeli gangster. He died at 51 of cancer in 2004. He was serving a life sentence from a situation in 1982 where he killed two of his drug trafficking partners. He was considered one of Israel's most dangerous prisoners and once got a prisoner who was set to testify against his wife, stabbed 131 times despite being held in a guarded cell. So Shemaya takes this guy under his wing and also teaches him how to read. And as Ben has reported, he's fond of, of Ayn Rand, right? Yes, Ayn Rand and Nietzsche. Also, um, Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. I, I haven't read the, the book, but he, um, in, in his testimony in, in the big 512 case against them, he talked a lot about these books. And, and Nietzsche, he said, uh, thus, thus spoke Zarathustra, <laughs> changed his life behind bars. Uh, I don't know if that's an indictment of Nietzsche or not, but he really said it uh, made a big difference in his life. And that's how he learned to read with these books. So I don't know if Ayn Rand gets any of the blame for this, but, um, I think it definitely, definitely, it definitely does. Definitely. I, does. Does. I mean, Alice shrugged. Yeah. Uh, oh, here's a so quote typical. from, from you talk, you know, so yeah. typical. Of course he's an Ayn Rand guy, you know, <laughs> here's a quote from him. I was born into crime, grew up in crime, was breastfed crime, heard crime, did crimes. All of my life. I was in one giant bubble of crime. There was nothing else, nothing, a pit and nothing that was connected to normal life. I knew the world of crime, the laws, rules, grammar, but the normal world. And as you can see, actually, you know, but the normal world with a question mark at the end of it. I phrased that wrong. But either way, as you can see, this guy, he loves doing crimes. And it's actually, it's it's all he knows. You know, he was a product of his environment. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case. I think definitely in the story he tells, which again, his life story got to take a little bit of grain of salt. But, but the story that he does tell and just the facts of being from a really large family with a ton of siblings, basically a one-parent household in Lod in the 70s in uh, Binyan Rakivit, like a boxcar building, they call them. Um, you, you, that, that's a hard place now. That, that's, a tough, that's a tough town now. So I can imagine what it was like in the 70s, how poor it was. I'm not saying a guy like that never had any other options, but I can understand why he, somebody like that would feel like they didn't and would feel like he didn't have a chance. And also, if you combine that with his natural talent and charisma, you can see how, you know, he was destined for that sort of success. You can also imagine, like I'm sure you said in other podcasts, this, this type of guy like this, if he had been, if he had grown up in a different family in a different neighborhood, he could have been, you know, could have been a doctor, a lawyer, he could have been a politician. But um, Fortune 500 CEO, you know, like, you know, his lawyer said he was extremely charismatic and all that. Yeah. But he ends up getting released from prison, I guess he's 29, 30, and he just gets right back into it. He's importing drugs on a global level, killing people on three continents, you know, the usual. He once described going into the underground casino business, and when asked what he brought to the table as a business partner, he answered, I bring with me 13 years in prison. I bring with me Yitzhak Abergil. In other places, if you lose money, you don't pay. Okay. But when I'm a partner in the business, there was no such thing as not paying. So, you know, that sounds like the kind of person you want to be in business with, maybe if he's on your side. Definitely. Ben quotes a source in one of his articles as saying, until Yitzhak Abergil, we didn't know about feuds between criminal organizations. We had local feuds, local fights between gangs, not organizations. Israel's anti-organized crime law was put in place in June 2003 because of him. He was in charge in Israel, and also in Thailand, Spain, Belgium, and the USA. This is not something that we've known before, and it's not something that has come back since. And you have another source saying, he's the most superior high-ranking criminal that has ever existed in Israel. In his personal capabilities, his personality, his disturbed psychopathic approach to life and his intelligence and charisma. He is the most dangerous criminal that there has ever been. That type of thing you, you didn't really have. In addition, obviously, also to the technological stuff they have now, that the, the type of means they have at their disposal to, to kill people and track people and all that is, is, is quite good. So that wasn't there before. Um, and and he's, he's kind of the, he's the guy who kind of built that and inspired that. And he had the, I guess you could say he had the vision to be a, uh, you know, to be a ground, you know, groundbreaker in that sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, him, the, the DEA, along him and Zev Rosenstein, they called them the Escobars of Israel. And it said that he was once, at one point, one of the top 40 drug traffickers into the U.S., which means he's competing with, like, all the Mexican and Colombian cartels, Dominican importers, things like that. His organization trafficked ecstasy, cocaine, hashish, and other drugs around the world, from the U.S. to Belgium to Japan moving between Morocco, Spain, Belgium, and the U.S. itself. He and his brothers, I think there were three others that were actively involved, 
have been arrested and detained in multiple countries. I think they're still waiting on a five-year sentence for him in, in, in Belgium. And they're just truly this epic crime family. And they really are something out of a plot line, like I said, in Grand Theft Auto. And I think we see that most when they team up with the Violin Boys, that's with a Z, a Latino street gang in LA that was sick of being pushed around by the Mexican mafia, La M.A., who, you know, control Southern Los Angeles, or Southern California, I'm sorry, telling them what to do. You see, the Abergils had all this ecstasy, apparently even owning manufacturing labs in Belgium, but they needed help with distribution and protection in LA. I mean, sure, they're powerful, but like, it's not that they have a bunch of gang members and street dealers in the US. So this happens in 2000, they strike up a deal with the Violent Boys. The feds start to catch on shortly after, though, because these guys start making way too much noise. In July of 2002, they bust a big ecstasy deal in action involving three groups of people, including some big Israeli players and their bodyguards who are carrying automatic weapons. Now, the big player in the U.S. for the Abergils is this guy Moshe Malul. He's, he's their man in L.A. And another guy by the name of Sammy Atlas was there, too. He was in their ring. Sammy, though, he's not exactly the most loyal, gets a little too smart, tries to steal a shipment of pills and sell it on his own. Moshe and his brother, they catch on to this. They fly to Spain to meet with the Abergils, who decide that Sammy has to die. Then the Violin Boys, they catch them in a cafe in California, in, in Encino of all places, and they kill him in the parking lot. Unfortunately, one of the Violin Boys also kills a cop in 2003, and you know that puts you on the radar. By 2005, 1,300 law enforcement officers are involved in a huge sweep to shut them down. Like, don't, don't kill a police officer in the U.S. Like, I've seen it with the NYPD. I've, I've been on the scene shortly after it happens when someone shoots a cop, and they react like an army, like nothing else. You know, they will send the choppers, they will flood with officers way more than they need to try to set something happen. So that's, that's kind of what happens there. And uh, it's, again, it, it, it'll put you on the radar in a way you don't want to be. It's important to point out too, that the Abergils weren't just street thugs and drug dealers. Like they were actually quite smart and sophisticated. They ran a huge money laundering and embezzling operation, stealing tens of million dollars from an Israeli bank. And I also kind of wonder like, what, you know, who, who does the paperwork for these guys? Because I don't, I don't think they're the ones doing it. So they had, uh, with that, that was one of the bigger, uh, that, that was such a huge story in Israel in terms of kind of, kind of a, a turning point in, in organized crime and just in terms of the massive amount of money that it put out there that was able to seed all types of things. I, the, the estimate I, I've read or heard was somewhere between 250 to 300 million shekels, which comes out to about, you now it's about 3.2 shekels of the dollar now, so it's about 70, 80 million dollars. And, and, Jesus. and this was, uh, so they had, it was because of two main inside guys. They had a guy named Ofer Maximov who owed a lot of money to the mob and his sister worked for the bank as their head of investment or deputy head of investment. So she was, she was pretty high ranking in there. So she was able to em embezzle all this money for her brother. And, uh, yeah, it didn't, it didn't end well for her. She ended up going to prison, but yeah, they definitely had a guy on the inside and they, they exploited her as much as they possibly could. Look, I'm not going to get too far into it because financial crimes are, for the most part, boring and I barely understand it. But it seems like from this summary from the Times of Israel, they, uh, you know, they had these plans where they would push out loans to Israeli business people in the U.S. who were then extorted, so they had to give up their businesses uh, and just, you know, that, that sort of stuff, embezzlement, whatever. It's boring, but, but you get it. So unfortunately, though, the Abergils were about to learn a lesson that many organized criminal has learned before, which is shit is different when you start fucking with the U.S especially when you're doing so from a country that's an ally, because the Abergils, with the help of the Israeli government, were going to be put on trial in the U.S. Yitzhak Abergil and his brother, Mayer, they end up getting arrested in Israel in 2008. But we've kind of already covered how the Israeli criminal justice system is sort of inept, and how these guys were wild enough to go after all the prosecutors and judges and whatnot. We should also mention that there was another killing of a civilian in 2008 that shocked the country right around when this happened, which was a woman who was a social worker was killed in front of her kids and husband in an assassination attempt gone, ra gone wrong that led to another sort of coming to God moment for the country. So that's, you know, they were fed up with this stuff. Yeah, that was a huge, that was a huge stage. Her name was uh, Margarita Loughton. It was on the, it was on the beach in Batyam. The place, just tons of people, families, all that all around. And Connection to the crime family until his third offense. The Abergils are arrested in 08. They're sent to the U.S. in 11, 2011, convicted, and then sent back to Israel to serve out the rest of their time for this particular crime spree in 2014. The Abergils, though, they weren't the first Israeli mafioso to go through that process of extradition and trial in the U.S. That honor belongs to Zev, the wolf of seven lives, Rosenstein. 
who, if you remember, survived that bombing in 2003 and fought a vicious war with the Abergils after they tried to expand into his gambling empire. The Abergils actually met with a bunch of other crime families in Brussels in 2003 to discuss how to take out Rosenstein shortly before the bombing. One thing about the bombing, too, and why it was such a big deal, as, as, you know, as Ben talked about, this is Israel, right? They have their federal government uh, back then focused on the Intifada, their suicide bombings, terrorist attacks, Hamas, all that all over. So to see you know, an Israeli doing this during that time, people were pissed off. 